Hello, and welcome to episode 11 of Published by Greenleaf Book Group. My name is Tanya Hall, and today I will be talking with Mel Julwan and Dave Humphreys, the team behind WellFed, WellFed 2, and WellFed Weeknights. Welcome to Published, a podcast by Greenleaf Book Group, where we'll discuss the ins and outs of the publishing industry, from writing a book and finding the right publisher, to gearing up for a book launch. And now, here's your host, Greenleaf Book Group CEO, Tanya Hall. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Published. We've been blessed to include some of our own authors on our podcast recently, and it's been awesome to pick their brains about how they made it through the publishing process, and each of them coming from a little bit of a different vantage point. As I'm sure you've realized by now, if you've been listening along in our podcast series, no two authors have the same publishing experience as they move through this journey. So today's author will share another new viewpoint. Mel Julwan and Dave Humphreys are the team behind the best-selling Well-Fed Cookbook series, and Mel runs the successful blog MelJulwan.com, where she writes about her triumphs and failures in the gym, in the kitchen, and in her life. So while we normally handle the production work on the titles that we represent here at Greenleaf Book Group, sometimes we do take on books that are already packaged and retail ready, and we just handle the sales part of the publishing process. Not that that's any small thing, but uh, we do work in a distribution-only capacity at times. So the well-fed books definitely fall into that category. And for that reason, today, we will be focused primarily on their distribution strategy. So without further ado, let's get into the interview with Mel and Dave. Melissa and Dave, welcome to Published. Thanks so much. It's great to be here. Yeah, it's great to have you. you. So uh, you guys are definitely one of the Greenleaf success stories, and we've been so proud and um, pleased with the performance of your books over the years. Obviously, a a really great standout success for us and hopefully for you as well. Thanks. Uh, (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I I think it would be hard to overestimate how much doing the Well-Fed Cookbooks has changed our lives. It's been really amazing and surprising and awesome, and yeah, it's been a pretty fun ride so far. Yeah. Awesome. Well, let's get into that a little bit. So why did you decide to write a book? I I have a feeling I know why based on the success of your blog, but I would love to hear it from you. Um, I mean, I've been a writer since I was a little kid. My dad actually had the first story I ever wrote framed and hanging on his office wall. And I always loved to have my nose stuck in a book. So it was like literally a lifelong dream to be a published author. And then in about 2007, I was involved in roller derby in Austin, Texas, and wrote my first book, and it was published by a big New York publisher. And the whole experience kind of left me cold. So I felt a little sad (laughs) about my, my publishing experience. And then I started a blog just for fun to amuse myself to kind of get back into the world of writing for fun. And I was blogging about the things that were interesting to me. So at the time I was really interested in CrossFit and I was learning about nutrition and the paleo diet was kind of on the rise and I started eating following the paleo guidelines. And because my dad owned a restaurant and my mom was a phenomenal cook, I got into the kitchen and started playing around with recipes and the blog just kind of evolved from me talking to people I knew to starting to build an audience. And after about two years, they started pestering me for a cookbook. And I decided to take a stab at the publishing world again. But this time, Dave and I decided to team up and do it our way instead of working with a big publisher. Mm -hmm. So was it the creative control in particular that you felt was missing from your first experience with the traditional house? It was both the the creative control and also the marketing side. Mm. I felt I felt really let down by the the team at the publisher because I'd given them. I mean, a roller derby book was kind of an unusual thing to try yeah, to be marketing. Sure. Like I, I get that, um, but I spent a lot of time thinking about where I knew roller girls might find it and how to position it so that it made it, it ended up in the sports section of bookstores. It's not a sports book. Mm -hmm. It's, it's more about, you know, following your dreams and believing in who you are and empowerment and silliness and, and some about roller derby. Um, so that was really disappointing. And then also if you all could have been a fly on the wall, the day they showed me the first cover that they proposed, (laughs) I I, I couldn't believe it. (laughs) Like I'm literally, 
I mean, I was crying and there were multiple phone calls to the, my agent, like just trying to work it out. So yeah, that was, it was a little rough. Um, and I really did like my editor, but she had a very different idea for the book than I did. And ultimately I followed her advice, but again, just kind of pushing what I've felt in my gut was the right thing to do to the side and, and following their direction ultimately did not sit well with me. Mm -hmm. Well, and clearly looking at the books that you and Dave have created together, your instincts are very strong (laughs) in terms of content and design because the well-fed books are just beautiful. Thank you. We really like them too. (laughs) Yeah. Well, and they're successful. So the proof is in the pudding. Now you guys, of course, um, basically set up your own independent publishing imprint, if you will, um, Mm -hmm. named after your cat, I believe. That's correct. Yeah. <laughs> because we are we are nothing if not completely professional. <laughs> so you were selling it on your own for a little bit and then you approached Greenleaf for distribution help. So how did you know it was time to get some help on that front and take it beyond your Amazon sales? Uh, so I mean, the first thing we did, as you, you mentioned, we, we started out self-publishing uh, through a print-on-demand service. Um, and uh, we were just lucky enough to hit the market at a great time, and we were selling a lot, and which is a fantastic problem to have. Uh, but we realized that w- there were a few things. Uh, one is we sat down and, and kind of we did the math, right? We sat down and figured out um, if we print the book ourselves, uh, and warehouse it and distribute it um, or, or fund a distributor rather um, we're just going to make just a, a crazy amounts of money more than we were currently making we were only making a couple of like um, maybe a dollar or so a book and we were going to if we took on more risk, we would have more opportunity to make more money um, and uh, we also realized that if uh, we looked at Greenleaf and we realized that if we went with you guys, that that would unlock bricks and mortars for us. We, we had previously been online only uh, and getting into, uh, you know, Barnes and Noble and all that uh, would have absolutely be an advantage to us. Um, and then the third thing was the quality. Uh, our, the books that had been printed on demand were printed on low quality paper with you know real low quality um inks uh the binding wasn't solid in a lot of uh situations so people would get the books open the book and the book would fly apart like a deck of cards you know it just <laughs> explode um and that and was that not was, on purpose huh <laughs> no, that was not, not a feature not an intended yeah. um and so, you know, all of those things together were just incredibly compelling for us to reconsider uh, what we had done and, and move to a more, uh, I guess, traditional model with making the books, uh, you know, uh, thousands at a time and then warehousing those. And then uh, and then we found you guys and, and it completed the whole uh, chain. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then that's, again, been a a really great journey because now, of course, after Well Fed, we had Well Fed 2, and then the third installment in that series, Well Fed Weeknights. So having worked with our distribution team now and and having sort of that inside line into um, what is often sort of the backwards world of publishing and book distribution, what, what have you learned or what's the biggest takeaway from working with the distribution team to get your books out into the marketplace? And did it impact how you developed your second and third books? It did. The, I mean, the biggest thing that we found is that putting our books uh, in, in, in bricks and mortar places give our online brand more exposure. Uh, in the past, our website had been the road to the book, and now the book had become the road to our website. Um, and that was significant uh, for us. And it, it primed the path for the, for the second book. Um, uh, for this, uh, one of the things that changed for us for the second book is that we uh, needed to start thinking about marketing a lot earlier. Um, for the first book, we just decided to, you know, put it together and see what happens. Uh, and that went great. And for the second book, uh, we needed to uh, sort of take a step back and have a better plan as we, we got to to launch uh, because we had other people who were involved now. Um, you know, you're involved, our printer's involved, everyone pl- uh, needs to have a good plan to get to a solid launch. 
Definitely. That's something, that's a drum that we beat here all the time because uh, the retailers in particular, as you know, have such a long lead time. And Mm -hmm. the more we can give them in advance of that date, the the more solid our pitch is and, of course, the wider distribution we get. So that is definitely key to that expanded reach in the marketplace. So can you describe a little bit more about that in terms of what you guys developed as a marketing strategy to support the launches of those additional books? Because you, Melissa, your platform is amazing, and I often use you as an example of somebody who did a great job at establishing a platform first and then launching the book versus the reverse, which we see so often, which is yeah. <laughs> sort of uh, put the book out there and pray that a platform follows. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I wish that I could tell you that I had this master plan when I started, but really it was all very organic. I, you know, started my blog to amuse myself and then just kind of went from there. But we did find, I remember distinctly when we had our meeting to talk about WellFed 2 with Greenleaf and talking about the timeline, like I almost had a heart attack Mm -hmm. (laughs) when I realized how much sooner we were going to have to have things kind of pulled together. Um, And I think that's one of the challenges of self-publishing, right? Because you're doing so much of the you're doing the development of the creative work and also the marketing, which has huge advantages because we get to touch everything and make sure it's the way we want it. But it's also, it's, it's quite a bit to juggle at particular times in the process. Um, in terms of marketing and how I promote our work, um, my website has always been the hub of everything that I do. But because social media has grown so much, I also have all of the usual suspects, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and Pinterest, where I promote anything that I post on my blog and promote the books. Um, With Well-Fed Weeknights, which is our new book that came out in November, we actually did hire an external PR firm to work with us for the year leading up to the launch of the book just to try to get a little bit broader foundation in print because I don't really know how to reach those people. That's not my background. I don't have the contacts. Mm -hmm. And so we kind of had that helping us a little bit. Um, But again, I found true to form that the online stuff is really what seems to have driven so much of our sales and continues to build our community. Mm -hmm. I've seen that as well in some of the uh, partnerships that you seem to be so strong at developing. Uh, You seem to have a nice alignment with the whole 30 folks in particular. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, we have a really good relationship with them. And because I got involved with Paleo so early and because there were so many other people around that same time, we're like the class of 2010 or whatever, like everyone, (laughs) like all my, my peers who kind of started in the early Paleo trenches, they've become we have become for each other this kind of colleague slash competition network where we support each other, but we're also kind of in competition with each Mm other. Um, But that's great for guest posts and podcasts and, and um, you know, being part of online summits, like all kinds of contacts come out of having relationships with those people. And I really think that the, one of the keys to the success I've had in some of my peers is that we do work together even though we're both selling competing cookbooks, people's cookbook libraries are very large (laughs) and, and having them like all of us is better for all of us. So I think that there's a core group of us that have really worked together to kind of, you know, the water floats all the boats kind of approach. Yeah. I love that abundance mindset. There's enough Mm -hmm. for everybody. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, there is, there is for sure. Um, The other thing that I've started doing in the last probably two years is I do have a weekly newsletter that I send out and it's part personal letter where I'm very chatty about what's going on in my life because as my website has evolved to be more about the recipes, some of the personal stuff I used to post because my audience has gotten a lot bigger, feels kind of weird to just broadcast that stuff. So that's been moved to my newsletter, but I also have a weekly meal plan that I send out in the newsletter every week. So I think having that kind of distinct content that goes out every week gives people a reason to look for the newsletter in addition to the kind of chattier, friendlier stuff. And I feel like that's been really successful too. Great. Thank you for that. So you mentioned earlier the distribution of the book and the extra reach from brick and mortar having an impact on the overall business. Can you talk about that a little bit more and maybe some examples of how that's changed uh, how you and Dave do your business? Yeah. I mean, one of the things that 
was really fun for us is having been an online centric business in the beginning, like when we started hearing from people who bought the cookbook that had never been to my website, it was like, <laughs> this is amazing. Hey, these are people we don't know. <laughs> You're backwards. Yeah. Um, and I think that there's a level of credibility for better or for worse. There's a level of credibility that comes with being in a brick and mortar store that you don't necessarily always get if you have only an online presence. Um, you know, it, it still means something to people to walk into a Barnes and Noble and see a book on the shelf. Mm -hmm. So I think that that has been, you know, that definitely, I mean, we can see from our sales that that's been a, you know, a big part of growing my community. Um, the other thing that I think is really cool and kind of unusual is that because our book was in book people in Austin, um, we were contacted by a publishing company that does special interest magazines. And because we self-publish and we own all of our content, we're now able to do these special interest magazines with them a couple times a year. So it's a way that we are able to reuse existing content in a new format. We still control the content. We, you know, do all of the creative work, but they do the publishing and distribution on their side and they sell them in the checkout lane of Whole Foods. And like that wouldn't have happened if we weren't in a physical store. Yeah, that's so, a great point. Opens up some other opportunities that you really can't predict on the front end. Absolutely. That's awesome. I love that story. So uh, for the listeners who are maybe just getting started in exploring the world of distribution and trying to find that partner, uh, what's a good piece of advice you would give to somebody? I'm sure you get this question from the various uh, folks mm -hmm. that you talk to, bloggers and so forth, who are exploring the world of publishing. What advice would you give somebody specifically around the whole distribution part of the business, how to prepare for that? I would say that, I mean, uh, I mean, the first thing that comes to mind, because there's a lot, uh, the first thing that comes to mind is, is to know your goal, right? Um, know what what you want to do. Uh, when we started out with the first book, uh, our goal was just to do it the way we wanted to do it. Um, and we, I like joked with Mel that like, you know, I hope we sell eight, eight copies, right? <laughs> you know, we just had, we had no sales goal. It was just like, we're going to make this thing as well as we can. And then we're going to let it go and we're going to see what it does. Um, but that was that was our goal, right? So, uh, and I think for different people writing different books, uh, you, maybe you want to be a speaker, maybe you're uh, in it to um, increase your credibility as a as a professional in, in whatever field you're in. Um, maybe you want to be a working author. I think that all of those have are very specific goals. I think that you can dig down and get even more specific inside of those uh, niches. And I think all of those have specific strategies um, that that you need to think about uh, as, as you're putting together your book. Uh, and then once you know your goal, I would say plan backwards from there, right? Uh, decide what you want to do and then decide uh, how you're going to get there. Um, and I would also say it's important to, to know your niche. Uh, it's important to understand um, what's already been said, uh, how, how how you're going to say it differently uh, or if there's another way you can say it um, that's that puts you apart from from everybody else who's who's doing it uh, again like when we started uh, we looked around and there wasn't anybody talking about paleo uh, the, the first couple of books came out and they look like something your doctor would hand you and just be like oh I'm, I'm sorry you're gonna have to be on this diet now <laughs> uh, and we wanted to compete with that right it, we wanted to present food that was both uh, delicious and and that it looked good um, and and you know so that was our that was where we were at. Now, everybody's doing that. <laughs> you know, literally everybody's doing that. Uh, and so, you know, we, for the, like, the last book, we needed to figure out uh, a, like a, a sub, sub niche, right? Is, mm -hmm. So uh, we started looking at what can you do quickly? Um, and, and so that's, you know, that was the goal for that book. So. Yeah, so this gets back to brand strategy and really mm -hmm. figuring out how to position yourself um, as you would with any product launch. Yeah, absolutely. The other thing that I would add is I think it's particularly for someone who is self-publishing, you've already shown that you're kind of 
you are strong-minded and maybe a little stubborn. Um, I think it's really important to work with partners that buy into what you're trying to do. Like when we came to you guys, you didn't try to convince us to be something other than what we were. And I really appreciated that. Like it's really, I think it's really advantageous to find partners who want to support your vision as opposed to shoehorn you into some predetermined track. And that's one of the things that I appreciated about Greenleaf is that it, from the beginning, it felt really supportive and like the assumption was, well, of course we're all going to be successful, which is really nice. <laughs> and and we were right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Mel, fun question. I'm sure you have uh, tested and tried many, 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 <laughs> many recipes over all of the years that you've been doing paleo blogging and the cookbooks and so forth. So what's your favorite well-fed uh, recipe of all time? I mean, that's almost impossible to answer. I'm but sure. <laughs> <laughs> Lately, <laughs> um, I'm, one of my favorites right now is the Bon Me Bowl from Well Fed Weeknights, which is our new cookbook, um, because it's like all of the really good parts of a Bon Me sandwich without the bread. So it's very flavorful. It's really fresh. It's great for summer. Um, and it tastes really good. And I can pretend I'm eating a Bon Me sandwich without actually eating <laughs> Eating that really delicious baguette that's usually on the outside of it. <laughs> right. <laughs> we'll just pretend to not miss that. <laughs> I mean, once you get used to it, it's really not so bad. Yes. <laughs> Having gone down this journey myself, yes, I, I can vouch for yeah, that. You know. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, that is all the time we have for today's show. So thank you so much, Mel and Dave, for joining us. Really appreciate all the uh, wisdom and insight that you've shared with our listeners today. It's our pleasure. Thank you. It's so nice to be with you. Thanks again. A big thank you to Mel Julwan and Dave Humphreys for joining us today. For more information and for links to Mel's website, visit greenleafbookgroup.com slash episode 11. That's a numeric 11, greenleafbookgroup.com slash episode 11. If you haven't already subscribed on iTunes, go ahead and click over, subscribe to stay up to date on all of our new episodes. Thanks for listening to Published. To learn more, please visit greenleafbookgroup.com. And remember to subscribe to this podcast on iTunes.